Hey guys, yeah, the moment has finally come. I feel like I should be sitting here right now going, <laughs> The magic board is officially back in action. It feels like forever since I've had the luxury of being able to use this baby right here. But believe it or not, it's only been just over a month. Like I said, it feels like forever from my perspective. Don't know about you guys. I actually, though, I have to admit, I feel a little bit like a fish out of water, a little bit awkward right now. Don't quite know what to do with myself, but I'll work it out. It's all good. Anyway, today's video topic. This morning, I worked out that we currently have six house jobs within the West End Woolloongabba District Neighbourhood Plan area. So that's six jobs that are in various stages from the initial concept phase where we're talking to the designers trying to come up with a proposal that we think council will actually support, right through to applications that are literally going to be approved by council any day now. We are one town planning firm in Brisbane. We have six jobs at the moment. Imagine how many jobs there are across all of the town planners in Brisbane. It's ridiculous. West End is literally boom town at the moment. So given that it's obviously going through a hot phase, a boom phase, I thought that in today's video, we would focus on what the requirements are under the West End District, Wooling, sorry, West End Woolloongabba, it's a mouthful, West End Woolloongabba District Neighbourhood Plan, more specifically within sub-precinct NPP 001, because the rules and requirements that apply to that specific area are very, very prescriptive and in turn, very, very restrictive, and they have a major impact on the design options that you have for proposals in that area. So if that sounds like it's something that interests you, stick around. Okay, so before we dive into looking at exactly what the requirements are for this sub-precinct here, we first should probably talk about what neighbourhood plans actually are. Now, under City Plan 2014, which is the rule book that we all operate under, you have zones. Zones are kind of city-wide rules, so they prescribe the rules and requirements for the city as a whole. Underneath that, you have overlays. Now, overlays focus on, I call it constraints. So things like flooding, vegetation, heritage, things like that, that again, they affect the city as a whole, but they get a bit more site specific, I guess you'd say. Then under that, you have neighborhood plans. Now, neighborhood plans are council's way of going really, really local. So bring it down to that smaller, smaller level. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so sometimes you will have site specific rules within the neighborhood plan. And the best example I can give of that is the old Red Hill Skate Arena. Within that neighborhood plan, there was very, very clear rules and requirements for what council wanted to see on that site in particular. More often than not though, they cover a local area. So it might even be just as small as a few streets. It might be this neighborhood plan as a whole, but it's like I keep saying, it comes down to that more refined, smaller, finer grained sort of planning. Now. Today, like I said, we're going to focus on NPP 001. So what area does NPP 001 actually cover? Well, it covers everything from Vulture Street at the top down to Granville Street down the bottom. And then from the side to side, it's from Boundary Street to Hargrave Street. So it's actually not a huge area. There's literally maybe 10 streets or something like that. But believe it or not, we get a lot of inquiries and jobs. Yeah, inquiries for jobs is what I'm trying to say within this little pocket here. So now that you understand where the neighborhood plans come in and blah blah get my words out <laughs> now that you understand where the neighborhood plans come in and what this specific precinct covers let's talk about the purpose i had to think about what i wanted to talk about next the purpose okay so now some of the heritage experts out there might want to correct me here so peter dennis throwing it over to you but my understanding is this is one of the first areas that was developed within brisbane so it has the really really old housing stock like i'm talking super super cute pre-1911 houses most of these houses are little humble workers' cottages. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, essentially they're very low set and very small and very, very cute houses. Council recognizes that that sort of tells the story. See, back in the day, people didn't have the money, they didn't have the luxury, whatever words you want to use, to be able to do grandiose houses like we have today. They were sticking to the bare minimums. These days, obviously, we go massive. Like if everyone could go three or four stories, they would love to go three or four stories. So this obviously, the sizes of the houses, the appearance of the houses, the low set nature of the houses helps to, like I keep saying, tell our story. It describes it, yeah, in a visual way, it describes our history and the phase that we went through. Council sees that's important in terms of telling our story, our future, all that sort of stuff. So they want to try and preserve that. As a result, they have very, very specific requirements to help try and achieve that purpose. So what are they? Well, first and foremost, let's start with secondary dwellings. Quite simply, they are not allowed within NPP 001. Now, site cover. When it comes to small lots, it's sort of a sliding scale. You start with 50% site cover for lots over 400 square meters. Then you go down for lots 300 square meters above, becomes 
200 square meters above become 70%, making sure I get my numbers correct there. So that's the standard rules that apply to the city as a whole. Within this sub precinct, you have to go a maximum of 50%. So unfortunately, it does mean that you are slightly limited in the building footprint that you're allowed to do. Now, number two, again, across the city, small lot rules say, if your block is greater than 25 meters in depth, you need a minimum rear boundary setback of six meters to tick the box, get out of jail, go home, do whatever you want to. That's a poor way of describing. You get what I'm saying. <laughs> so yeah, six meters if your block is more than 25 meters in depth. If your block is less than 25 meters in depth, you need three meters, and I am simplifying this, to the bottom level and 4.5 meters to the top level. However, within this sub precinct, you need six meters to the rear boundary in all instances. So again, it does restrict the extent of development that you can have on that property. Now, built to boundary walls, B2B walls, as I like to call them. Yeah, nah, they're a no go. <laughs> so again, generally speaking across the city, you can often have a built to boundary wall. People use it for a garage typically. When it comes to this sub precinct, yeah, council doesn't necessarily like them. Now, front elevation. This is the kicker. This is the one that always, always, always catches everyone because everyone's like, oh, I've got grand plans. What I'm going to do is raise the house up, build under, we're going to double the footprint. Yeah, no, this one here, yeah, it's going to catch you. Let me tell you why. And it's a bit of a mouthful, so let me write it out. Oh, what was it? 65, yeah. <laughs> Man, I almost got that around the wrong way. <laughs> So what they're basically saying is your front elevation, a maximum of 65% of that front elevation cannot go over 40.8 meters in height. Did I say that correctly? What I'm trying to say here is you can't, you have to make sure that a minimum of 65% of your front facade is at or below 4.8 meters. So that stops you from doing the usual raise right up to 9.5 and enclose underneath. That one, yeah, it's a kicker. It's so, so painful. But I can understand, again, if we go back to what the purpose of these requirements are, the purpose is to maintain that cutesy, humble, historical sort of feel within that pocket. And that obviously is trying to keep the houses at that lower level to work in with that purpose. Recess. You need to ensure, in an ideal world, that the ground level, so the bottom level enclosure that you obviously want to do, which everyone wants to do, is set back a minimum of two metres from the outermost projection on the front of the house. So if you have a one meter front wide, let's say a bullnose veranda along the front, then you need to step it back a further meter from that front facade. Now, pitch. Council likes to see some nice traditional, yeah, traditional is the best way to describe it, roof pitches, some really, really steep roof pitches. So they prescribe a minimum roof pitch of 26.5 degrees. Oh, that's, I said percent. I should have just gone degrees. Let's just, let's just try and wipe that out without messing my my pretty little image up. <laughs> okay, stairs. They love, love, love front external stairs that link the ground up to the front level. Now this catches everyone out because everyone goes, oh, well, I just want to raise the house, fill in the balustrade, have access down the bottom. Or the other thing people go is, well, if we raise it, we obviously then have to fill in the gap between where the stairs were and where the stairs are now. And that's suddenly, more often than not, these houses are very, very close to the front boundary. So then the stairs suddenly encroach over the front boundary. So that caused a lot of issues. People go, oh, we'll just rip them off. Yeah, no, no, you won't. Council wants them. <laughs> okay, now the eave height. That one. So we talked up here about the front elevation requirements. This rule applies to the side and the rear. Council wants to make sure that, yeah, you're still subject to the 9.5 overall height limit, but they want to make sure that the eaves do not go over 6.2 metres in height on the side and the rear. Again, I sound like a bit of a broken record here, but the whole purpose is to maintain that short, sort of cutesy, humble little footprint design, all of that sort of stuff. So I think that covers everything I want to talk about. We've got all the requirements there. We've talked about the purpose. We've talked about the location. Yeah, I think that's about it. Now, as always, if you guys have any topics or any content that you want us to cover off, please, please, please share, bring it on, add it in the comment section below. We obviously have a list of potential topics that we can pick on at any point in time. I often sit there the day of and go, oh, which one am I feeling? Which one am I vibing? Which one do I feel like talking about today? But I'm open to ideas. If you guys got something that you go, hey, I really want to know about this, throw it at us. Until next time, thanks for watching. For all you red tape lovers out there, I have one thing to say. Well, no, actually, I've got three. Number one, the advice provided in these videos is generally
general in nature. It's not site specific. You would be a silly Billy to go and make financial decisions based on this advice without first checking with the town planner. Don't be a silly Billy. Number two, Brisbane Town Planning is in no way linked to Brisbane City Council. The views expressed in these videos are my own, not council's. So if you don't like them, blame me, not council. Number three, what was my number three? Oh yeah, the views expressed in these videos are accurate at the time of recording. If you're watching this video back 10 years from now, the views may not be so accurate. That's all.